folks, we're out here at Narry Warren North and uh, we're here to talk to you today about the Kelly Cahill story. Um, so welcome to uh, Euphenort Australia and uh, we're going to have a look at uh, the, the entire area where uh, the event happened and we hope that uh, you get a bit of a sense of an idea of the, uh, the location anyway. Um, and we've got Ben along with us today. Ben is one of our new team members. G'day Ben. G'day Andrew. So Ben's come all the way down from Bansdale today to talk to us about the Kelly Cahill story because he's been investigating the, uh, the events uh, that were um, done at the time by Bill Chalker and um, also Keith Basterfield was another one and John Ocatel I believe was involved a fair bit as well. Um, he made some conversations uh, with uh, Kelly and uh, the events that happened to her. Um, as you can see at the moment there is a hell of a lot of traffic on this road so the, uh, the location has changed okay, a Okay so we're going to head down now to the actual location and give you a bit of a, a pan of the area and then I'll hand you over to Ben and Ben can tell you exactly the whole story about Kelly Cahill's experience. So it's over here where the paddock is and you'll be able to see um, coming around the bend here. Okay so all right, so this is roughly the area where um, Kelly Kale had her event. She was across the road over there and uh, her husband, her and Andrew, came across the road. So I'll hand you over to Ben now and he can tell you the whole story about what happened with Kelly. Thanks, Andrew. No worries. We're uh, in quite a unique location here. Uh, 19 years ago on a, on a dark, cold night, a event occurred that was uh, almost unprecedented uh, in UFO history. We had a case where there was a sight of a UFO occupants and more excitingly we had independent witnesses to this event. There was actually three parties that saw the same thing occur. Now that makes it pretty special because a lot of times a lot of cases are actually single people yep. and not a lot of trace evidence yep. and you pretty much have to take their word for for what happened so this case was very strong because at the time it had the three witnesses and also out in the field behind us here they found trace evidence out there magnetic anomalies and marks in the paddock so that makes it pretty hard to argue that it was all in their heads that nothing actually happened so why were they here? Why were they here on that, on that cold night? Kelly and Andrew had come up for the day um, from your lawn where they lived and they were driving up to Kelly's friend's place, Eva, who lived at Mombolk. And on the way up, they actually noticed a series of orange lights out in a paddock. Well, Kelly saw it actually. And she, just, she saw it and she just thought it was a really odd thing to see. And she was very reluctant to mention it to Andrew at the time because um, I think he was fairly, fairly much a straightforward sort of a guy. And she noticed the lights, they went past it. And then she said to him, oh, I think I saw some lights back in the paddock. And he basically treated it fairly, fairly low key and said, no, nah, well, that's, you're just seeing things, you're crazy. And she felt like a bit of a twit yeah, I could imagine uh, for saying it. And I think she actually regretted mentioning yeah. it to her husband that yeah. this, this actually occurred. So they continued their drive and they arrived at Eva's place and Andrew then went into the city to be with his friends uh, for the evening and Kelly and Eva went to bingo. Oh yeah, they went to bingo. That's went right. to bingo, yep. That's, yep. yep. And they stayed at bingo until about 10.30, had a great time there and as most bingo will have and they left and arrived back at Eva's house at about 11 o'clock. That's up in Mombolk, isn't it? Up in Mombolk, yeah, Mombolk. Yeah, yeah, up in Mombolk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Andrew was already waiting for them. So they ended up leaving Eva's house at about 11.30 to 11.45. They hopped back in the car and they drove back down this road and into something that they both would never forget. Okay, very good. So uh, at that point in time they what, pulled off on the side of the road? What happened was they, they, they were driving along and they saw the lights again and they noticed a bright flash across the road and it was a really confusing thing for them because they'd been traveling at 100 kilometers an hour yep. and they came through this daze where the car was going instantly 
40 kilometers an hour. So the flash, the actual flash though was so bright, it blinded them. It blinded it? them, yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely brilliant, yeah. The brilliant bright flash. <laughs> bright flash. And the confusing thing for Kelly was that she, re she remembered being on the other side of a roundabout that they hadn't passed through. <clears throat> So it was like time stood still or there was a, a click in a record player and, and it jumped. They had just basically moved in, they just moved across in that period of time. And they felt very dazed and confused after this, after this occurrence. And they drove back home and they arrived home at 2.30, which was very, very late. It should have only have been an hour and a half's trip. Yeah, so they've had a case of missing time then. And missing time, an hour and a half of time that was unaccounted. And they were, they were, they were very confused about, about what had occurred. And from that point on, a lot of strange things started to occur. Yep. Kelly was having heavy menstrual flow that was not actually her time of the month. And it was very, very unusual for her. She had a triangular mark near her, located near her belly button. And some other odd effects also that uh, she was electrically charged with things like soil and wood. Things that well, weren't... Well, you mean like they they would give her, they'd, they'd, no, they'd give her like a little shock. Oh, uh, okay. So she had a bit of a charge yep, yep. from those things. And, and one of the interesting things was that Andrew's starter motor in his car yep. would turn over. Oh, okay. And he would run inside. He would run what, it on its own. On its mean? own, yeah. He he would wow. run. How's that? He would run outside of the house, thinking that someone was trying to steal the car. Yeah. Go out there and. This was, is when they were at home. This is when they're at home. This is back in your lawn. Oh, okay. So this is after the event. They've gone home to your lawn. Yes. And then all, all these kind of events started happening after that point. After that oh, point. Okay. Yes. Right. So, at that point, they they were really experiencing some really unusual unusual things. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Kelly had had a series of dreams or other encounters of, uh, of a creature being beside her bed, a tall, yep. a tall black creature. Yep. And after it, it tended to fade from memory fairly quickly thereafter, and they went through a period of time where they couldn't remember what had occurred. Uh, and what, how long did this go on for? Uh, it was about into September when they so went. So this is months. Later. A month later. A month later. A month yeah. later. They, one month later, guys. One month later, they went to a friend's party. Yeah. And they started talking about all things wild and woolly that you'd talk <laughs> about at a party, around the fire or whatever. Yep. And the topic of UFOs came up. Oh, lovely. And surprisingly... <laughs> we know what that's like, don't we, folks? <laughs> yeah, it's not a very polarising issue. Yeah. And um, basically, it was Andrew who raised that they'd had an encounter. He said, well, you wouldn't be talking like that if you had seen what Kelly and I saw. Yeah, yeah. And Kelly had no memory yeah. of what had occurred. Sorry, guys. She... <laughs> I've got to keep this up here. He's a, he's a young apprentice, but he's learned well. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly had no idea, um, or her memory had been blocked of this actual, yep. of this actual event. Yeah. And it wasn't until a little bit later on they'd gone back up this road and they'd travelled back up to Eva's place for another for another visit with Eva. Yeah. And Kelly was feeling really odd in the car and she and she said, "This would be a great place to see a UFO." And she just said that out of the blue. She just said it out of the blue. And then we're on the same road. On the same road. Okay. And it came out of her mouth. And at that point, it was like a film had been triggered in her head. Okay. She got to Eva's place, she bundled Eva off to, to bingo by herself Yep. because she was feeling in no place to go there and listen to the numbers being called out that night. Oh, okay. So she sat on Eva's couch and the events began to come forth for her and she, she recollected what happened. So she was just night. sitting on the couch and then somehow all this stuff started flooding into her mind. That's about correct. All the events that had happened. It was like a dam had been opened. Yep. And I'm sure those memories would have been very horrific, yep. very real, yep. and an experience that would have been absolutely terrifying for her to have a recollection yeah. That, yeah. that her person had been all but yeah. violated yeah. by yeah. by an unknown an unknown entity. Yeah, yeah. So she was in a very very confused place. Now Kelly was also a a strong Christian. And I didn't know that. Yes, she was oh, okay. a Pentecostal Christian. Yep. 
and There's a church, church just up the road here for Pentecostal church going. I don't know if she went to that church. <laughs> <laughs> I can't verify that. Scholars. Can't verify that fact. Yeah, coincidence. <laughs> but she had had Bibles at home, and she read the Bibles back to front and highlighted them to within an inch of their lives. Yeah, yeah. And this put this experience for her into a very unusual context. Yeah. Because she was coming at it from an evil, evil, demonic type of a, type of a position yep. through the framework that she viewed the world. Yeah. So it was a, a very, I suppose you could say it was a very, not just the experience itself was intense, the actual framework with which she lived also enhanced that experience for her. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, so... We might talk about what actually happened out here in this field. Yeah, sure. That That'd we're standing here on this yep, nice yep. warm day. Let's have a bit of a pan out to the, the field out here. And we'll show you exactly... Uh... <laughs> oh, sorry guys. We'll, we'll show you exactly the... This is the field out here um, where the event supposedly happened. Uh, ben, to help me out here, was 150 metres out. 150 metres out from this paddock, from yep. this location. Yep. They came around the corner and they saw the big orange lights yep. and below the orange lights was a aqua blue ice cream cone shape of light beaming down onto the, onto the actual paddock itself. And the only light that was there on that dark night was that aqua blue light. Okay, so folks, if you can imagine uh, around this area here in the distance, um, there are scattered houses, but they're far and few between. It's all pretty much just paddocks. Um, there is no lighting, there's no street lighting, lighting at all, there is absolutely none. So you can imagine, we're now talking 19 years ago, it would have been even worse then. So we're talking pretty much pitch black. Pitch so black. that's it. So it's pitch black and the UFO was sitting over there hovering about, uh, let's say, two houses high, for example, uh, when this blue beam that Ben has been talking about came down so this is where it actually gets a, a little bit scary doesn't it that's correct all right yes. so you want to tell us the rest i will okay i will okay so when they came around the corner they kelly was very excited because here they were seeing something that was that was very unusual and they pulled the car up on the other side of the road from where we're standing and they crossed the road onto this area here where we're now where we are now standing here and 110 metres back down the road, she noticed another car had also pulled up and the people had actually gotten out of that car. Let's um, cut for a minute. Let's move this way. Because I think we're getting too much of that. Yeah. So we'll just go to here. One, two, three. Okay. The only reason that Kelly could actually see the second car was because there was actually a third car beyond that car, about 25 metres back from, from that location, and its headlights were on. So those people in the second location were appearing like a silhouette to her. Yeah. Now, it didn't really sort of occur to anyone for them all to gather together and approach this unusual sight as a, as a collective group, yep. which may have been a nice idea. I don't know, I wasn't here at the time. So they crossed the, they crossed the field together, Andrew and Kelly, and they came to this fence line here. And they stood in awe of what they saw. It was incredible. As Andrew said, it was a two-story high house, about four car lengths width in its width. And they stood in amazement looking at this object. Then Kelly noticed at the bottom of the blue light a tall, dark, skinny shape appeared. And how tall was this? Um... It was about seven feet tall, which is actually taller than your average, your average human. Yep. Unless you're playing basketball. Yeah. It appeared at the bottom of the blue lights, and it stood there, and she could see this soul figure standing there. Then, uh, materialising behind the first figure, eight more figures, exactly the same, began to appear. And this one is by where one. It gets really spooky. I'm getting, I'm tingling now, yeah, I'm just old, thinking uh, about it because pimples going right now because it's, uh, we're in the right spot. We're in the spot. Right? This is it. This we is just got the time frame wrong, but yeah. this is the right spot. This so. is the field. Now this is where it gets absolutely incredible. A shock wave passed 150 meters 
across this field and it hit Kelly and Andrew almost like a freight train. It was like a subsonic boom from a bass amp at a concert and it thudded deep into their chests. That's when the horror actually hit them for the first time. Until this point, they'd been just fascinated by what they'd seen. It was yeah, a fascinating experience. It was just a light. It was a light show. Yeah. It could have been New Year's Eve. Yeah. But at this point, once that shock wave actually hit them, the eight beings, and I'll call him the leader for want of a better word, yeah, yeah. their eyes suddenly began to glow red. Yeah. Red like the coals of a fire. And they crossed the distance of this paddock 150 metres in three seconds. Three seconds. They split into two groups. And that wasn't, from what I know, that wasn't running across the field. They it was like hovering across the field. Hovering across the field. They weren't interested in our Olympic records. They crossed that field in three seconds and split up into two groups. One group headed towards the second vehicle, located 110 metres back this direction. They headed across here somewhere. And can you imagine what it must have been like, you've been hit by this shock wave. There are seven foot tall skinny beings with ultra red eyes crossing that field in three seconds towards you. I think that would be... That would be the most scariest thing. Undescribable thing to imagine. And I believe from what I've read about the case, it looked like they had like goggles on. Yes. And the goggles were what turned red. Yes. Um, so that, yeah. And, and, they, and they did not take their eyes off Kelly and Andrew. Yeah, and it was like the eyes were where the energy was coming from. Yep. So they were approaching them like this with their eyes on them at all times. Yeah, yeah. Now, one interesting thing that Kelly noted was that this was not like your average SAS operation or the police where they would all mill around, discuss what's going to happen, the options. Yep. These beings moved with a synchronicity and an understanding that they were actually one. one. Yeah. So it was instantaneous, no hesitation. They knew what they were going to do and it occurred. No one faltered, everyone performed their job. It was a synchronous team event. So let's move on a little bit now. So they came across the field to where Kelly was. Yes. What happened then? They came across the field. Kelly and Andrew were surrounded by the beings and Kelly received a blow to her stomach and she ended up down on the ground and she and was which went backwards didn't backwards she? Yep. and she ended up down on the ground yep. and they couldn't see Kelly couldn't see her her vision had been blocked it was like she had been I would almost say like you'd been caught in a snare yep. where they've, they've totally uh, caught their prey for again one of a better word yep. and they've got them subdued okay so she's down on her down on her haunches she is she is sick on the ground and she hears Andrew say why did you hit Kelly and she passes out now there was more recollection of the event yep. and there were some really strange words exchanged by the leader of the group to to Kelly and Andrew and presumably the same thing may have been going on back over in the other location as well. Yeah. It basically, Kelly through her Christian framework was really viewing them as devils or evil evil incarnates. That might have been because of the, the eyes being so red. The eyes being so red, yes. Yeah, yeah reds are very much a, a, a colour associated in that area. Yeah. So the being basically had a very taunting and very mocking manner about it and it was almost looking at the humans like they were really insignificant and it basically said to Kelly that I am your father and Kelly absolutely went ballistic she said you are evil you are not my father I am not your daughter you are evil 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 and the address kept going by this creature and the only thing that was happening was her and the creature She's moaning and hysterical, and she said that she, she thought that it faltered for a minute when she actually was screaming. What about the other beings? Were they around this taller they, being? They were around and hovering around that okay. area. And it's, it's, it's actually a little unclear because even in her book, it's not 100% clear exactly what every creature was doing, yep. exactly what everyone was doing. I think 
from the experience that they were having, yep. that was a very confusing event. It all happened very fast. And it all happened very, very fast yep. and instantaneous. Yep. Now there's an hour and a half of missing time. Yep. So something else occurred in that, in that hour and a half. Yep. And they may have been on the ship. Uh, the second party down the road had recollections of that actually happening to them. Kelly and Andrew didn't have any so recollections. So the people down the road that were 50 metres away, yep. they believe they got taken on board the ship? That's correct. What and about the other one further along? We don't know. We don't know. Okay. We don't know about the right. third one. Because the third one didn't show up anywhere, did he? No, and as far as I can see, it was a, it was a, it was a passive, uh, passive witness to, yeah, the, okay. to the events. Okay. And he may have had an obscured view as well. Yep. And may have been a bit put off by yeah, what he was actually yeah, seeing yeah. and didn't actually become involved. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's my, my theories. So it was, a, it was a very, very confusing time. The women, interestingly, in the second party, also experienced marks on their skin, menstrual issues. Yep. And it was almost as if the women were of primary interest to the creatures. The men actually have very limited memories. Bill, the uh, gentleman in the third car, had limited memories of what occurred. Andrew had limited memories of what occurred. It seemed to me that they were mainly interested in the women for what reason we can speculate? Well, let's speculate for a minute. I mean, we all know that um, there was a lot of discussion and we're not going to put lay, uh, the information down to you as being gospel, but as you know, there are a lot of people out there discussing why are they here and a lot of the reasons are that they're trying to interbreed with us. Um, what does that mean at the end of the day? Do they want to join us or do they want to interbreed and eventually take our planet away? I don't know. There's a lot of theories. But uh, that just goes on from what Ben just said about, you know, the, the women seem to be the prime focus here. And that could be the reason why. Um, in regards to the idea of seeing the guys with the, uh, the, the red eyes, um, I can't tell the exact story, but there is actually another case floating around from overseas where there's a guy who saw these uh, creatures that uh, looked like they had goggles on and they were red eyes, uh, very similar situation, same sort of uh, spacecraft come down, the whole bit. So, you know, there is some credibility to uh, Kelly's story and keep in mind this is a long time ago and this other event happened a lot later at another location in a different part of the world. Good chance that the person had no idea about this particular case. So um, there is a lot of credibility to what Kelly has said. That's correct. That's that's absolutely correct. Um, and basically, from this point, it turns to the investigation side of side of things. Yep. Uh, the aftermath of the event, Kelly actually did end up in hospital with a with a uterian um, condition. Yep. And she was quite sick for the period of time after yeah, long, after the event. A long time. A long time. From what I know. She was very sick. And when she was ready to, she actually contacted Bill Chalker in New South Wales and told him yeah and then what happened from there bill uh because he was in new south wales a long way away he uh referred her to john ocatel here in melbourne and uh she, she approached uh, john and uh, john said yes i'll uh, i'll take a look at the case um john's involved with the pra group as you know and um he has a lot of uh good knowledge on this sort of thing with abductions and so forth so, uh, yeah, so the case started from there as far as the investigation goes. Uh, John led the way uh, in this particular thing. So, so there we go, people going past. <laughs> I think they're UFOs. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> okay, we've moved on from the actual uh, location of the encounter. We've come back up, uh, back up the road towards Mombolk. And we're on the Mombolk side of the roundabout through which uh, Kelly and Andrew passed and where they had the uh, the blinding experience and we're just going to give you a bit of a shot of the impression of the road that they were traveling down and it's a very hot day today but uh, this was the road they were on that night yeah we're, we're up around about 38 degrees today so it's a typical summer's day here in melbourne <laughs> um, as you can see uh, this road is also very busy and is so all the way up the mountains to the, to the top of the dandenongs uh, where monbulk is yeah. So we're going to pick up the story now from uh, the point of the investigation. Uh, when Kelly first started having the, the memories come back to her, that was on Friday the 1st of October 1993 when she was at Eva's place to which I referred earlier. Yep. 
On the 4th of October, a few days later, that's when she rang Bill Chalker and Bill referred her down to John Ocatell. And John immediately got on to placing ads in the local paper, which he, which he actually did. And on the 17th of November, so, you know, over a month later, uh, he's approached by the people from the second vehicle. And that's when the investigation starts to get really interesting because the second witnesses have been found. So that was a very, uh, very much a, a, big, a big part of it. Um, and from that point there, John went out to the location about 11 times. So he had 11 visits to the site that we came from, which I think is a, shows a fair degree of thoroughness, if, um, if that's accurate, that he's been out there 11 times. That is a, that's a lot of times to visit one location. I mean, uh, if you go back to the Westall case and you also look at the Valentich case, uh, how many researchers or uh, investigators have actually gone back to the actual site um, that many times? I, I don't know of anybody who's done that. So if uh, that's what John's done, uh, congratulations, John. It's, it's a big effort to make uh, the trip all the way out here um, to, to visit that site. Yes, yeah, it was absolutely incredible. And they conducted all sorts of, uh, all sorts of tests out there. They measured the area. They, they measured the, the marks on the ground. They took uh, magnetic readings out there. And uh, in Kelly's book, Encounter, there's a, there's a picture of, um, of some of those readings and, and how the land had been affected by it. And I encourage you to read the book if you're, if you're interested in the case. Ben, what about, what about soil samples? Did they do that? They did soil samples out there and they did find some traces in it that were, um, that were unusual. But again, it was something that, that could have been there but it was there in a, in a quantity that they that they thought was a bit anomalous. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure what it was off the top of my head. But they did find some traces out there that um, that indicated that certainly there there had been something in that location at that distance from where they from where they were. Okay. So, so we got some physical traces that some physical uh, traces existed of, at the time. Yeah. Exactly right. So. Okay. So here we are. Like we said, we're on the uh, what is this? The Monbolt Road. Monbolt Road. Monbolt Road that goes up the hills and uh, where they came, uh, they travelled down from up this way and headed back down this way over here. Um, at the bottom of this hill is where the roundabout is. Um, and then just not too far on from there is the location where we were before. So uh, one of the interesting things, and I think I spoke to you about this, Ben, this morning, was that if you go on to Google Maps and you actually look at the location where we were, um, if you look from top down, um, you will see three marks on the ground that look like, um, I wouldn't call them burn marks. No. Um, but they're definitely uh, dark, shady, shaded areas that could be landing uh, gear or something like that. And that's Absolutely. interesting because we're now talking 19 years on and these marks, we've just seen those on Google Maps this morning. So who knows? I mean, there's a, there's, if we went back there today and we did some more soil tample, uh, samples, we may be able to find out even more because technology's moved on. Absolutely correct, yes, yep. for, for sure. Mm. And um, I think it shows that if, that if you can see it on Google Maps, even to this day, that uh, it was a fairly lasting impression. Yep, excellent. 19 years after the after the fact. Yeah. So, anyway, this heat's getting to us now, so we're going to wrap up this episode, um, and we hope to br to bring this to you very soon. And we know that you'll enjoy it. I'm sure uh, everybody out there was wanted to see a little bit more about the Kelly Cahill story. So for now, from me, Andrew Arnold, and from Ben, we'll talk to you again soon. Bye bye. See you later. Oh, 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 oh,